Gregory is a graduate of the University of Athens, where he completed his Bachelor of Arts in History and Research Masters in History from Leiden University. He is a leader in Greek genealogy and family history. Gregory's interest in family history began at the age of 16 in 2011. Since then, he has participated in all major Greek genealogy initiatives. Between 2016 and 2019, Gregory served as My Heritage's Greek Projects Manager. And in 2020, he founded his own business, Greek Ancestry, which is based in Patras, Greece. Now, Greek Ancestry's goal is twofold. Um, on the one hand, it makes Greek archival collections accessible and searchable online and significantly reduces the time and cost of research. And on the other hand, Greek ancestry aspires to build a culture around Greek family history and genealogy by setting high research standards and creating a concrete educational basis for anyone interested in the field. Um, just a reminder that for the duration of the lecture, participants' cameras will be switched off and their audio muted so that Gregory isn't accidentally interrupted and to avoid lag. If this hasn't happened automatically when joining the lecture, could everybody please turn off their cameras and mute their microphones manually? Um, also, for anybody who might have any questions, please hold them until the end of the webinar when you might type them in the chat function, which may be found below or on the right of your screen. And then I will read them out. Depending on time, Gregory will, will be able to answer some. I'd like to now welcome Gregory to begin his lecture. Hello, everyone. Uh, let me turn this on. Um, so hello, uh, I'm Gregory. And uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, the Pelagonian Brotherhood for organizing this, and especially Miltiadis who actually found me and invited me here. Um, and I don't know if you guys know this, but perhaps this is the first time something like this is being organized for Greek Australians. So far, all the, all the focus has been uh, on Greek Americans, so you are making a difference today. Um, so I'm here to talk uh, about Laconian ancestry, uh, but it's a huge topic. Uh, so imagine that about two months ago, we did a series of seven webinars and they were not enough. We should have done more. So obviously the hour we have ahead of us is not going to, to be enough. So instead of um, you know, going into details and stuff, I decided to tell you more about my story as a family uh, history researcher, hoping that my story will help you um, with your research and perhaps hopefully inspire you. Uh, so as uh, Milti Ali said, um, I started my research when I was 16. And uh, it's pretty interesting. I'm really glad because I'm, I'm giving this presentation today because in fact, it was two um, Greek Australians who were the uh, inspiration for me to start all this. Um, Dimitris Katsabis and Stelios Hagias. They are from Karitsa in Laconia, close to my village. Um, and they live in Adelaide. So, uh, you know, when I started my research, I started um, asking relatives for uh, you know, some stories, uh, collected some photos, searching online. And one day I came across this amazing website, the Family Trees of Southern Paranam. So this is a website created by Dimitris Katsabis and Stelios Hayas in 2002. Uh, and it's pretty, uh, pretty amazing because as you can see, um, it currently hosts over 45,000 names. Here you can see a list of last names sorted alphabetically. So you can find your family's uh, surname and just open um, a new tab and see all the, all the names registered all the people registered under this surname. For example, this is part of my own family tree. And as you can see, it's pretty um, impressive in the sense that we have managed to find information about people who lived about uh, 200 years ago and more. 
we know exactly, you know, when they were born, died, married. We have names for males and females, which is not obvious. Um, and also, um, there is what, what's great about this website, the Family Trees of Southern Pardon, is that you will not only find family trees, some of which go back to the 18th century, but you will also find some photos, family documents, stories. Here uh, at the top, you can see my great, great, great grandfather's signature. <laughs> and in this little box on the side, uh, there is more information you know, about this individual. Now, Family Trees of Southern Parnon works on a volunteer basis uh, by people just driven by their passion, you know, for Patrida and the, the families. Um, but it's also very professional. So all the information that you will find on this website is uh, based on some kind of sources. Nothing is uh, random, you know. So it's either oral history or, um, you know, documentation, but it's a very reliable um, source of information this website. Now, as, uh, well, right after uh, I got into the family Trees of Southern Partner team, um, and through my work with them, I met uh, a woman in, close to, living close to Washington, D.C. in the States. Uh, her name is Carol Costacos Petranek, and she is from, her family is from Ayos Ioannis in Sparta, right out of, out of Sparta. Well, another Sparta in the story. So um, Carol was very uh, familiar with international genealogy research. She knew a lot about databases and website and companies and all of that. And since the 1970s or 1980s, she had been trying to, to do something with Greek records. So Carol and I were talking uh, about the dearth um, of Greek records available and searchable online. Um, and one day we drove down to Sparta and um, we visited the metropolis, the offices of the metropolis. So we were literally astonished by what we saw there. We saw 26 marriage books, indexes of marriages, and some innumerable boxes full of paper, marriage papers. So we said, we definitely need to do something uh, you know, about uh, these records. Um, so we uh, talked to this priest, you see uh, right in the middle, hugging Carol, Father Seraphim. We said, Father Seraphim, is there a way, you know, these records can be preserved? Would you like someone to come in here and digitize the records? And he said, yeah, that'd be great if you can do it. If you can find the resources and everything, that would be great. The bishop would love to have his archive preserved and digitized. So the question then was who would organize and fund such a project? And uh, long story short, Carol reached out to MyHeritage. Uh, for those of you who don't know, MyHeritage is a very, very big genealogy company based in Israel, but they have records from all over the world, billions of records. Um, so my Heritage's CEO, Gilad Jafet, he expressed uh, enthusiasm and huge interest in Greek records, and he gave us all the support we needed. So we, uh, he gave us the, the equipment, cameras and stuff, uh, and he also funded uh, an indexing team, and we started working. So Carol spent two summers at the Metropolis in Sparta digitizing uh, the marriage records. And last summer, she was there to digitize the, all the village books. So all the village books from the entire, um, from the jurisdiction of the metropolis of Sparta and Monavasia, Carol digitized last summer about 150 parishes. Um, here are some photos. Uh, Carol and me setting up equipment, uh, sitting there with the records. Um, so let me tell you real quick what this collection of the Metropolis is. So the Metropolis has this collection of marriage records. Um, every time someone wanted to get married, 
they needed to get a permission by the bishop. So the local priest would, like, would write a letter to the bishop asking for his permission, and the bishop would get back to the priest most times saying, yes, go ahead with this marriage, it is fine. The, their concern was for the couple to not be uh, closely related, okay? Um, so there are two types of records. On the one hand, we have the index books where all the licenses were registered. And on the other hand, we have the original licenses, the actual certificates. You can find all these on my heritage. Um, you can search either through the generic search engine or through this um, special uh, search engine for Sparta marriages. You can search by first name, surname, village, whatever, in Greek and English. And also there you have a great algorithm with um, spellings and stuff. So even if you misspell a surname, you'll be fine. Um, so when you find uh, a record, you will be given not only the uh, index book entry, but also all the documentation pertaining to the specific marriage. Now, all this extra documentation, it really varies because re oh, records were not preserved in the same way. The archives were moved multiple times, especially during World War II. So many of the records have not been preserved. But for the great majority uh, of the marriages registered, uh, there will be additional documentation. Now, you can find the priest's, the original priest's letter to the bishop. You can find the bishop's letter back to the priest, the license. Uh, but we have also seen all sorts of stuff. We've seen uh, photos of people. We've seen uh, certificates by the, the mayors, you know, confirming that this man um, was born in our village. Um, we have also seen contracts, dowry contracts, briques, and all that is available on my heritage. Now, here you can see two photos, um, th these two types of records. So on the left, there is an index book, and actually this is one of the very old ones. Each line, uh, each group of boxes corresponds to one marriage, and you can get like the, the name of the groom, the bride, the best man, if this was their first merge or not, the, the priest, uh, the witnesses, guarantors, all, everything, everything. But here's what happens. My heritage indexed only these index books. We did link the index books to the licenses, but you cannot, the licenses are not translated or transliterated. So you cannot search through the licenses and you cannot in this way um, easily find all the great information the licenses uh, include. So these licenses and the, the rest of the documents may include information the index books does not have. The age of the groom and the bride, the, the index doesn't have that, the license does. Or names of other uh, relatives and family members. For example, if the bride's father was dead, her mother would sign the papers. And that's very, very helpful for the family uh, historian because this is not something, mother's name is not something they could find easily uh, through other types of records. Or for example, you may find uh, something like Gregory Contos, uh, uncle of the bride, uh, Pavlos Contos, uh, cousin of the bride. So you, in some cases, you can reconstruct um, a considerable part of the, of the family tree relied only on these um, licensed documents. Imagine that in some cases we've also seen like little family trees drawn by the priests themselves because the priests wanted to show that, you know, the groom and the bride are not closely related. So they would build their trees to, to show that. Um, so the thing is now that these licensed documents are not translated, how are you going to translate them? How are you going to know, you know what type of record this is? Is it the license or is it the priest letter? Is it a certificate or is it a contract? 
And then what happens with the spelling? So what if you find a different spelling to what you knew so far? Or where you, can you find more records like this? Or how reliable is a record like this one? Uh, what if there is um, conflicting information with other types of records? Which one should you trust most, more? So, um, you know, I was thinking about all these questions people would have when these records would uh, finally be uh, released. So for this reason, I found in my own um, genealogy business uh, in January. So Greek Ancestry is a genealogy business based in Patras in Greece. Um, and as Miltiades said in the introduction, we have two goals. So yes, on the one hand, we definitely want to make more records, more Greek records available to people, easily accessible, searchable, uh, for a low cost, easily, fast, you know, all that matters. Um, and like now we host uh, over 350,000 records in our website for all over Greece. And we have new areas and records on the first of each month. And we have, you know, we're running many uh, new digitization projects and we help uh, with private research and with all documents like the, the, the merge licenses of Sparta I showed you before. But at the same time, we are really um, determined to build this culture around the field, to help people by giving them all the tips they need, all the knowledge they need to um, advance uh, or start their family history research. So in between May and July, I think, or June, <laughs> I don't remember, we did a series of seven webinars, which were free. Uh, we write articles all the time. We offer free um, genealogy consultation through Skype. Um, so doing all that, we are trying to set some standards in the field to um, standardize uh, spellings and stuff, uh, terminology, to, to educate people, for example, how they um, can cite their sources and why they need to do so, all, all kinds of stuff. And in June, we also started um, a new platform, Yaya and Me. Um, our goal with that is to help um, the diasporans, but especially the youth, um, connect with the Greek heritage, but not, you know, simply by conventional, traditional genealogy research, not just by building a family tree, because perhaps not everyone is interested in doing that. But, you know, but by giving them stories about their village, by uh, helping them relate to other people's stories, by helping them connect with others, by helping them inscribe their own family history within larger historical contexts. So we write posts um, and we have an Instagram account for Yai and me. And, you know, we, we try to, to promote this idea of reconnecting with your roots through uh, um, a new way, not just genealogy, but more historical uh, and cultural uh, manner. Um, so uh, here's the, the website. Uh, on the left at the top, you can see our homepage. There is an education tab where you will find all this uh, that I was talking about all this time. And then to the right is the search uh, button. So if you click on search, you will uh, get a list of all the areas for which we have records. They are sorted um, by alphabetical order. So it's very easy for you to find Laconia, of course, because you, Laconia is what you're interested in. So you will click on go under Laconia and you will get this um, new page, search page. Here is the search engine. You can search by surname or village in both Greek and English. Our algorithms are not uh, as advanced as my heritage, so you will need to be careful with spellings, but the, we have a free tool. Um, you can just fill out a form for free and we will give you the correct spelling uh, of the names you, you need. 
So uh, you can just type a surname. Uh, I search for Pycopoulos, who is the, our uh, host today. So um, here are some records for the Pycopoulos family from Agoriani, Sparta, uh, from uh, the 1930s. Um, and there are many more. So you just need to scroll down a bit. Um, now, using this record ID, you can then place an order in order to receive the, the original record, like the image, a translation, a full source citation, and of course, more information that was available on the website. So on the website is like, the, the, the records you find on the website are like our menu, okay? It's just a list of what we have. There is much more information about all these um, people. Um, now, what do we have from Laconia? So our Laconian collection is pretty, uh, pretty extensive. Uh, we have at least five uh, big collections. I will talk to you about the three of them. So first of all, we have the voter lists, um, which span from the 1840s to the 1880s. We have over 18,000 records for those, and they are very, very important because they cover um, the information they include covers most of the 19th century, and they can help you get back to the, the revolution times and the early uh, 19th century. These voter lists are, uh, some of them are handwritten, other are typed. They're all uh, available on the website, very easy you know, to, to find. Um, and then we just released on, on August 1st, we released this new collection, the parish voter lists. Uh, covering the period from 1912 to 1935, and even later in some cases, over 36,000 records. That's for, for Laconian standards, that's uh, really, really phenomenal because I think that now there are no chances that you will not find your family in our databases. All, everybody should be in there. And what's really interesting about this collection is that it is the, the ideal um, link between what we know, you know about our Papudas and Yayavas today and the 19th century records. So using this collection, you will be able to fill the gap between uh, you know, the 1880s and the 1920s. So everybody born within that time frame should be found in these records, in this parish photo list, or you know, their parents will. Um, now, what are these parish photo lists? Every time a village wanted to needed a new priest, they had to find one and elect him. So every time an election uh, would take place, a voter list of all people eligible to vote would be created. So this way, uh, we have lists for the parishioners uh, of the villages, men and sometimes women, I'll talk about this later. And um, in some cases, in fact, you can find more than one parish photo list for one village. So for example, you can find a parish photo list for 1912 and then another one for 1920, 30 and 35, which is great and very helpful because it helps you um, see the development of a family, you know? Uh, throughout the decades. But uh, although these two collections are uh, impressive uh, magnitude wise, I think that the most interesting one is the one I've put at the top of my list here, the captives list. When uh, Ibrahim Pasha invaded the Peloponnese in 1825, he burned many of our villages and massacred and of course he took many captives, men and women, primarily women and children. Um, so we have found lists of those captives. When governor Kapodistrias, um, you know, uh, came to Greece and took uh, responsibility, he um, expressed a very systematic interest in recording all those captives and finding them, in releasing them, you know, 
or some of them were bought back. Others just ended up in the slave markets of the Middle East. So we have these lists and we have uh, indexed them and translated them. We have found over 500 people uh, from Laconia, from many of the villages. Uh, my family had many captives and Yeraki and the surrounding villages had many. Also the villages down towards Molai, all those villages had uh, many losses. What's also interesting about this list is that they do not only give you the um, captive's uh, name and surname, but they can also give you his or her age, um, where they were held in 1828. Like it can, it can say, the record can say like, uh, they are still in Egypt or they are in um, you know, Libya. Um, and in some cases, you can also find out who owned the captives, the slaves. So this collection is really, really interesting. And I think it is very relevant as we approach the 200 years from the revolution. Um, some more stuff about the Paris photo lists. So they cover about 100 villages. And the information they include is very helpful. You can see um, an example of such a document on the, on the right. You get the surname, the first name, the father's name, the age. In some cases, you also get the occupation. But to me, what's most interesting is all those side notes, the little notes here on the right. I don't know if you can see them. Um, so for some of the people, it says, like, he is in America. Right, so this person, this voter has migrated to the States and the other one has migrated to the States and the other one's in the States and the other one's a soldier. So these side notes can help you tremendously with your research in finding out, you know, uh, which members of the family had already migrated, which were already, uh, which were still there in, in the village. Um, so that's very helpful and interesting and also uh, in many cases, you can find women in these records. So if the father of a family had passed, his widow would take his place as a voter. She would vote for the new priest. And for example, if there was an unmarried uh, orphan girl, an adult, an adult woman, she would also be given a vote. So... Um, these records uh, reveal things that other sources cannot reveal. Now, it is very uh, interesting. Um, if I was giving this presentation a year ago, I would have started by talking to you about the General State Archives of Laconia, the GAC, based in Sparta. Um, I would tell you, you know, you need to go there, you need to contact them to find everything and stuff. And it's really interesting how much we've managed to do and change uh, in 2020. Perhaps 2020 is uh, a very good year for Greek genealogy <laughs> and not for anything else. But yeah, it, lots of things um, changed in 2020 in these eight months. Um, but of course, you know, we cannot digitize everything. Uh, we do not have access to everything. And the archives are still there, of course. Um, here's the, their website, and I've also included their email address in case you want to contact them. So they have things we don't have. They have Mitro Arena mail, mail registers, the Motologia, municipal registers. They also have school records, which are uh, pretty amazing because they are not just you know, list of all the students with their names and stuff, but also um, they will tell you, they will give you the grades your ancestors took in each of their classes at school uh, and throughout the year. So you can also see uh, uh, how good students they were and their progress. Uh, and in some cases you can even find um, side notes saying, for example, this student did not attend school because he was working at the fields with his uh, family or this student was an orphan, um, you know, things like that, which are very interesting. Also in school records, you can find women. Women will not be found in the mail registers, right? 
they might be missing from municipal registers, especially if they had migrated, but they are definitely in the school records. Um, and then the, the GAC, the archives at Sparta, they also have notarial records, contracts. And these are another treasure of information because it's not just about you know, sales and purchases. Uh, you can also find wills. Um, you can find diaries, prikes. So we're talking about amazing information available in those records. And um, imagine that I was, I was inspired about two months ago and I was talking to this friend of mine and he was telling me that he found so he, he found a contract of his family back from like 18, the 1850s. And there was some dispute about some land or stuff. And um, he, the, his ancestor wanted to prove you know, that the land belonged to him. So he started narr narrating his whole family history uh, in that contract in order to prove his case. And so my friend found the contract and found his whole family history, where the, ca the family came from, when, uh, what was her previous name, why they changed it, everything in one single document from the 1850s. So the GAC really have treasures. You definitely need to, to contact them. And they also publish a lot. They have published many books, which are very helpful. They have um, transcribed old contracts and they have made indexes of names. So they are very helpful and they're available for free. Uh, you just need to go to Sparta to get them. Um, and also what I want to bring up about these is you should not underestimate any of these sources. Ideally, you want a family tree and a family history built uh, on as many uh, different types of records as possible. And it's not just about you know, the extra information its type of record gives you, but also um, it is because of the, the ability you will have to, to uh, uh, confirm the information. So there might be uh, conflicting information between different types of records, but you, the more information you have, the more records you have, you will be able to um, cross check. Um, so you will definitely need to, you know, to go on my heritage and get all the marriage records for your families, and then you know visit my website and get the, the voter lists or see if you have any captives in the family. Uh, and then you also need to contact the archives in Sparta. They are very friendly, very helpful. They reply to emails, even in English, uh, and they would give you, you know. Uh, whatever you ask for, for free. So they, they are amazing. So you need to, to work in all these different directions in order to achieve a very good result. And there's even more. Um, so for those of you who are into social media, uh, there are many uh, Facebook groups, uh, genealogy groups, um, but the most impressive of them all is the Helene genealogy kick by Georgia Stryker Kilman. Georgia's families from Ayus Ioannis in Sparta and Ayus Ioannis de Olovos. So another one more Sparta in the story. Um, and she has this blog and uh, a Facebook group. The Facebook group currently uh, has over 27,000 members, most of which are active. And that's impressive. It's the only, uh, uh, you know, uh, group community, which has such um, uh, 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 like an audience. And, but most importantly, these groups are ideal if you, are, if you want your questions answered. So many people will be very willing and glad to answer questions and help you for free. There are resources, um, you know, uh, being uh, shared. Uh, articles, uh, you will make new connections, you will find people from your own village and exchange information. There are, you know, photos, family photos published, so you definitely need to check this out. Um, and I guess this is pretty much what, what I want to bring up. Uh, here uh, is um, a special discount coupon 
I, uh, we issued just for this um, presentation today. So if you go to the website and you find on Greek history, if you find something of interest, a record for your family, you can um, have it ordered and you will use this coupon Leonidas uh, and get the discount, but it's due Sunday. So uh, Sunday is the expiration day. Um, okay, so I think this is it. Thank you. I will turn this to um, Miltiadis. And there is also time for questions, I think. Um, wow. Uh, thank you so much, Gregory. That was such an impressive lecture. Um, and it was so completely thorough. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if not too many people have many questions left unanswered. I think that was how thorough it was. Um, and like Gregory said, um, today we began a partnership that hopefully um, sparks new interest among Greek Australian organisations in helping their members connect to their ancestry in the homeland. Uh, thank you, uh, Gregory, for taking the time and the effort to prepare this webinar. And thank you again, Iper um, Efaristo, for um, sharing your knowledge with all of us tonight. Um, and thank you again um, for the coupon. That's very special. And I, I know you didn't have to do that, but thank you for that. And the Paikopoulos and the Paikopoulos records. And, and the Paikopoulos <laughs> records, of course. I know. Well, actually, my um, many cousins and family members will be tuning in as well. So they'll all be grateful for that as well. All Paikopoulos. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to now open up the the lecture to questions. Um, if anybody has any questions, don't forget to put them in the chat on the um, the chat bar on the right, or to ask them on um, Facebook Live. All right, so we have some questions. Um, we have a question from Olympia. Um, oh no, we have a question from Nicole. Hello, um, Rigori, for such, uh, thank you for such an amazing lecture. Have you ever considered coming to Australia to present an in-person lecture to Greek Australians? <laughs> we were talking about this with uh, Miltiadis mm -hmm. and we said that at some point the Pelican Brotherhood should invite me over to, to give a presentation. I'd be glad to. I, I agree completely. I think um, Palakoniki will be writing up a formal invitation very soon and sending oh, cool. it off to <laughs> Patra um, for sure. Um, I, I have a question actually as well. Um, in your research so far, Gregory, um, I know that it's probably common sense that Lakonia um, has not been the easiest place to database and archive. Um, yes. Out of the rest of Greece, though, I've noticed that your database is, is growing um, and you're covering many other regions in Greece. So far, which region um, has been the easiest um, to database? I'll tell you what. So uh, it really depends on the types of records we're working on. Um, to be honest, Laconia, we, we put most of our effort in Laconia, in Arcadia, uh, so the, the, the areas where most migrants um, left from. So Laconia was not easy, but it, it is the one which is um, the, the most covered one, okay? And then follows Arcadia. Um, we have a pretty extensive database for Thessaloniki because we have uh, a, a very big voter list, like 40,000 names from there. Kanya also. Uh, 60,000 names. Um, so I would say that we, we focused more on the areas which had more migrants. So these are uh, the most well covered. Uh, I can tell you which are the ha hardest. <laughs> the hardest areas are uh, those which do not have um, preserved the archive systematically. So some islands. Uh, the Dodecanese, for example, are really hard. Uh, they were under Italian occupation until the 1940s. Um, Epiros is hard. Uh, Macedonia is hard. Uh, all those areas which became part of Greece in the 1910s. 
so it's really a combination of historical factors, uh, a lack of archival mentality. Yeah. Mm. Um, we have another question here. That was an excellent answer, Gregory. Um, so we have another question from uh, Rosemary. Um, hi, Rigori. Do you know the date of the earliest record you have researched? Uh, the earliest record I've researched? Oh, oh boy. I guess it would be something from the late uh, 18th century. Uh, the earliest record on the website, perhaps, is um, a mail register entry from Cabos in Crete, in Cañá, from 1817. Mm, that's very early. That's to, to it have is that early. <laughs> it is early, yeah. Um, we have another question. Um, unfortunately, no name, but um, her mother is from Molay, Molaus. Um, will I find records for this town? I think we do have records um, for, for Molay on our website, but if we don't, uh there will definitely be marriage records for her family uh, on my heritage and then she will also contact the the archives in sparta i hope that answers her question i think it does um another question um gregory from paris stavrianakos um would these records suggest that many families from modern sparti have been in the area from since the revolution um, I would say that most families have been in the area since the revolution. There was great mobility before the revolution and during it. Uh, in fact, the 1840, um, the, the voter list from the 1840s also include information on whether the family, the voter, is a native or not. And in many cases, you see, like they say, he came here in 1825 or you know, he has many years here, or things like that. Um, so there are ways to actually find out if a family is native or not. And it's also useful to take into account the, the size of a family. So a very small family could indicate um, migration from somewhere else. Mm. Um, I, I, I agree, I think that that made, that's common sense as well. Um, another question, Gregory, from Angie Rice. What sort of impact does the occupation and civil war have on the accuracy and completeness of the records? And have you found differences in researching records relating to male versus females? So to answer the, the latter uh, first, so records for females are harder to find. I had written an article about this, uh, and you can read it on, on Greek ancestry. Um, the reason is females were not important for the bureaucracy. Men voted, men paid the taxes, so men served the military, so women were just left on the side and records were not really kept for them. You can also see that in marriage records that they say, they also always say, you know, um, Costadina, daughter of. For the males, it's always, you know, just your name, Miltiades Paikopoulos, right? Not Miltiades, son of. So you see this um, gender uh, dimension. Um, but there are records for women, as I said, the school records, notarial records, the marriages, the municipal registers, the dimotologia are also helpful. Um, and there are also, for Sparta, and perhaps, <laughs> Sparta is one of the very few uh, cities and municipalities which have this type of record, female registers. Um, these are very rare. The Sparta ones start, I think, around, the, around 1835 or something for females. They're very helpful, but they're not for the entire Laconia, just for the municipality of Sparta. Yeah. Now, regarding occupation stuff, yes, many records were destroyed during wars and all of that. Uh, the archives of the metropolis of Sparta were removed multiple times during the war. I think they were taken to monasteries at some point, you know, to be preserved. Um, but also, we definitely need to point this out. We should not um, blame just the war that we don't have good records because records are being lost even today. If there is no war, 
Um, I've heard stories you cannot imagine about how uh, records are even stolen. Uh, so we have to be very um, determined to preserve the records. Mm, In fact, I'm thinking, I'm thinking to go to Sparta next year with Carol uh, and make like um, a donation to the metropolis, uh, give, them the, give them archival folders and everything. And we will work there for a month I guess to preserve the collections archivally. Well, that that that'd be very generous of you. Uh, it's Greg. needed. It's, it's needed. needed. But also, you are you are very generous. I remember on your website recently, you actually um, donated your archives, I believe, to the was it the FD here Foundation or was it the FD yeah, Femia right. Foundation? Yeah, that was here very gen yeah project. That was very generous as well. Um, another question this time from Litza. Um, let me just read this out. Um, too many questions. Um, so many questions now. Um, actually, I'll just read out one from Ilias. Um, what are your current projects and focus areas at GreekAncestry.net? I can't say that. <laughs> uh, we were working on a very big um, city directories project. Mm. Uh, which is the first, this is going to be the first time such, uh, this type of record will be used in uh, extensively in Greek genealogy research. We are adding new areas. You will see new stuff coming up soon. Um, and uh, let me see. Mm. We, might need, uh, we might do uh, uh, a project with government gazettes. Uh, which is also going to be interesting. So there is more to come, but I cannot reveal everything. <laughs> Fair enough. I think discretion is important. Um, <laughs> now for Litter's question, I've got it up. Is it possible for this to contribute to our family's tree that is from migration to Australia to the current day? Um, so if I understand this question correctly, Lita means if she can find records for her family since migration to current day. That depends on the records preserved and available in Australia. Uh, if she means, if she's referring to the Family Trees of Southern Parnon website, and if she, she implies that she wants to add information for her family on there, that's very easy. Just contact um, Stelios, Dimitri. There's also a Facebook page. Um, it's interesting because uh, it's easier to trace family in Greece in the 19th century than today <laughs> because uh, records of the 20th century are not um, available. Uh, it does not really make sense because anyway, personal data and all that laws are uh, a bit... Uh, not very well thought, um, but yeah, uh, it's it's not really easy to find information for, you know, let's say after 1950s onwards. Hmm. Um, now for another Pekopoulos, Thodoros. Hi, Gregory. Apart from people using these records for family trees, have you come across people using these records for other purposes? I guess Theodore already has an answer to this. Uh, there are many people um, who need these records for citizenship. Uh, they uh, want to prove, you know, that the grandparents or great grandparents were born in Greece, so they are looking for records. Um, and I would say that this is it, pretty much. Uh, in the past, uh, there could have been, you know, uh, an effort of people to reclaim uh, property in Greece, um, but today I think it's more about family history, interest, and citizenship. Um, another question now um, from George. Do you have any records from Adna or Pagliovrisi? I think so, yeah. Just If you just go to the website under search Laconia, type Adna and Pagliovrisi. Uh, Pagliovrisi should be spelled like this. 
and you will uh, you will find records. Perfect. I know that a lot of people will be um, finding this very helpful for their own research. Mm -hmm. um, the last question, I think, so far, Gina. Hi, Gregory. Thank you very much for this. Are there records of marriages, deaths, baptisms from the 1800s or earlier? And I think you've mm -hmm. already answered that a bit, but... So the, the marriage records of the uh, metropolis of Sparta, the earliest records from 1835. Uh, there are no records for before that. Um, the birth records of the churches, we digitize those as well, but they are not available online yet. Um, these start later. Yeraki and Mistras, I think they have the oldest records. Those of Yeraki begin in 1859, and Mistras something like that as well, but not for earlier. Most For most villages, you can expect to find records for after the 1880s, 1890s. The majority, unfortunately, um, 1910s. Well, that's very relevant uh, considering yesterday's lecture was also on Mr. Das, so uh, right. there's a connection there as well. Um, another question from Rosemary. Um, during the Ottoman occupation, were any records kept in Turkey? Yes, they were. Uh, censuses and tax registers were kept. Uh, the thing is, these are not available online. Uh, some of them are circulating online, but uh, it's not very clear what's the source and all of that. So I would not necessarily uh, encourage someone to look for those. Um, and there are also other issues like um, many of those records do not have, um, they might include, you know, a, a name, my name, Gregory Contos, but not my father's name, not my age. So they are helpful more for historical purposes that rather than purely genealogical. You cannot uh, rely on these records to build a family tree back to the 15th century. Um, I think that's it so far. I can't see any more questions. Um, in that case, um, I'd like to thank you again, uh, Gregory. Thank you. It's almost 7 p.m. Um, it's an amazing opportunity that we've all had here to listen to you and to get some exposure to your website. Um, just to Thank reiterate you. that Gregory's website, um, his Facebook page and um, all the other information will be um, posted um, online on our page and we'll be sharing that. Um, one last question, I think we can fit it in um, before we finish up. Um, let me just get that up there. Um, Gregory, when did surnames come into vogue in Laconia? And that's from Dimitri Katsambis, your friend. Right, Dimitri Katsambis. Hey, Dimitri. So um, I think it seems that we, we, have, we have seen surnames uh, in the late 18th century. It definitely depends on you know, the area, the village and all that. But I would say that in general, the rule is that name, surnames started being used um, after the revolution uh, when they were needed to the bureaucracy. People needed a surname. So you, you can see it. For example, if you see early marriage records, the same surname uh, has three different versions. So I, I was translating a document the other day and it was, um, I don't, uh, Manusakis, Manusopoulos, and um, Manusos. So for the same family, three different versions of the surname, which means that the surname has not, had not been standardized, which means that a, a, de, um, a generation uh, before, it could have, it could also not be there at all. And also you see people using two surnames. So for example, uh, let's say Canelis or Kodakos. That, that shows there was, surnames were very, um, what's the word, fluid and not systematically used. 
Um, another excellent answer. Um, thank you so much, um, Gregory. Um, I know that you've probably got a lot of uh, interest out of this, and I think there'll be a lot of Greek Australians who will be flocking to your website now. Um, so I'll be winding up the Zoom lecture now. Thank you to everyone for attending. And um, just uh, another alert that we've got another lecture on the history of Thermopylae itself on the 25th of August and um, a lecture on the 10th of September um, by a young Greek archaeologist who is digging at Amiklis in Sparti. So um, I recommend that everybody uh, tag along to those. And thank you uh, so much, uh, everybody for um, tonight's lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye, everybody. Bye. Thank you so much for coming.